odd we have three expert speakers, superior researchers, leaders in the field, and they're going, I'm going to show you excerpts of their half hour lectures. You can find the full lectures of each individual lecture and also a combined panel discussion on the Room Now website and our YouTube channel. Our first speaker is Dr. Atul Deodar, who lectured on five advances that he thought were important in spondyloarthritis. Second, Dr. Dennis Podubny from Germany is going to talk about the evaluation of the SI joint. And our last speaker is Dr. John Ravel from UT Houston. He'll talk about what does it mean to have a positive family history of AS. You'll enjoy these three lectures back to back, and at the end, we'll take your questions. Enjoy. You know, the importance of MRI in diagnosing excess arthritis cannot be overstated. We know that this MRI is very sensitive and can be false positive. And you probably have looked at this study before. This was a study done on 12, 20 healthy recreational runners and 22 elite ice hockey players. None of them had excess arthritis, but they underwent MRI scan of the sacroiliac joint. And the ASAS definition of positive sacroiliitis was met by 30 to 35% of healthy recreational runners and 40% of the ice hockey players. And what is this definition? This is a consensus definition of positive MRI, which states that on one slice of the image, if you see there are two areas which show sacroiliitis, which is bone marrow edema seen on stir image, which is the fat suppressed T2 weighted image, or if you see two consecutive slices and there is one area which is positive um, for bone marrow edema, then that is positive sacroiliitis. Clearly, this is oversensitive and less specific. What the figures show is an important teaching point. Where is this bone marrow edema in normal people? And that bone marrow edema in normal people can be seen in posterior lower ilium as shown in the middle figure on the right-hand side, or anterior upper sacrum shown on the top. And the very bottom figure on the right-hand side shows both anterior upper sacrum and lower posterior ilium. That's where, these are the danger zones. If somebody has bone marrow edema in these areas, that may not be because of an immune-mediated inflammation. That may be just because of excess activity. Erosions were absent in this study. So two white spots on the MRI is not specific and is seen in many healthy volunteers. So here is an important paper, data-driven definitions for active and structural MRI lesions for diagnosis of axial spondyloarthritis in the sacroiliac leg joint. And what is their predictive utility? So for this, the authors looked at the original ASAS classification cohort based on which the 2009 classification criteria were developed. All these people who participated in this original 2009 classification cohort study uh, had MRI scans done. These were read twice by seven central readers and by eight central readers. These are all experts. And they specifically look for the sensitivity and specificity on um, SIJ, quadrant sacral leg joint, quadrants. There are eight quadrants of the sacral leg joints and consecutive slices, and they looked for erosions, they looked for inflammation, they looked for sclerosis, they looked for fat lesions. And majority of the readers, these are all expert readers, had to agree for the presence of a definite lesion typical of excess polyarthritis with high confidence. And they were specifically looking at candidate lesions cutoffs for achieving specificity of 95%. And even more importantly, the same people who participated in this study were followed for 4.4 years to see that they really had axial SPA even later, 4.4 years later. And so the candidate lesions cut off achieving positive predictive value of more than 95% were selected. So very rigorous data-driven process. And what did they find? So here is the take-home message. I'm going to straight go to the bottom line here. Definite MRI lesions typical of axial SPA, there is a 3-4-5 rule. Very easy to remember, 3-4-5 rule. What does the rule say? It says that if there are erosions in three or more sacroiliac leg joint quadrants, or if there is bone marrow edema in four or more sacroiliac leg joint quadrants, 
or if there are fat lesions in five or more sacroiliac joint quadrants on one slice, and this is in the quadrants, okay, then it is highly likely, 95% likely, that this person has axial spondyloarthritis. So remember this three, four, five rule. All right, moving on to the third topic, multiple choice question. What percent of patients progress from non-radiographic to radiographic axial spondyloarthritis over two years? A, 2%, B, 5%, or C, 12%. Here is the answer. The progression from non-radiographic to radiographic axial spondyloarthritis is variable. What this slide shows is there are multiple studies have been done on this topic. The y-axis shows the proportion of patients or the percentage of patients that progress from non-radiographic to ankylosing spondylitis. And the x-axis shows the studies and the time period on which these studies were done. So the question that I asked was, what percent age of patients go from non-radiographic to radiographic at two years? So look at this number, 24 months. There are three studies. There is a study by Ruderman, which says 2% of the patients progress. Then there is a study by Dugados, which says 4.9 or 5%. And there is a study by Podugny, which says 11.6, which is like 12%. So if you answered 2%, you're correct. If you answered 5%, you're still correct. And if you answered 12%, you are also correct. Why is it that there are different, different answers we are getting on this question? What percentage of patients go from non-radiographic to radiographic? And the answer is these studies included patients with different, different baseline characteristics. The bottom line is 5 to 40% of patients with non-radiographic XLSPA will progress to radiographic XLSPA or ankylosing spondylitis over a period of 2 to 10 years. That's the important point. Now, the baseline characteristics, wait to see that my, in my third slide from now, I'm going to tell you which are the important baseline characteristics which predict which patient is going to progress or the risk factors for that matter. So here is an interesting study. This is the PREVENT study. This was published now a couple of years ago. Progression of non-radiographic XLSPA to radiographic XLSPA over two years in the PREVENT study. This is a phase three double-blind randomized placebo-controlled study of secukunumab versus placebo. Patients were enrolled with centrally read sacroiliac joint x-rays. So if the expert central reader said this patient x-ray shows definitive sacroiliitis, fulfilling modified New York criteria, that would mean this person has ankylosis spondylitis. Those patients were eliminated, all right? Now, these patients underwent and they half the patients were on circuitinumab, half the patients were on placebo. Placebo went up to 52 weeks. The second year of the study, everybody received circuitinumab. In fact, the patients who were on placebo, even in the first year, many of the patients, they didn't want to take placebo and then they switched to taking circuitinumab. So on the right-hand side, what you're seeing, look at week 104, 3.3% of the patients went from modified New York criteria negative to positive, which means 3.3% of the patients on secukunumab developed ankylosing spondylitis. And in fact, placebo, 2.9%. I mean, does that mean that placebo is more effective than secukunumab? I don't think so. I think the problems here is that, as I said, every patient over two years ultimately received secukunumab at least for a year. And many patients in the placebo group did not receive placebo for a year. Many of them, in fact, were receiving secukunumab. But even more interestingly, look on the left-hand side, the red bullet, the fourth bullet here. When the patients had x-rays done at 104 weeks, and these 104 weeks and the baseline x-rays were given to the same experts, except the experts were not told which is baseline and which is 104 weeks, so they were blinded. 25% of the patients, the experts said, in fact, had ankylosing spondylitis at baseline. Isn't that interesting? That tells us that even experts cannot differentiate really what is non-radiographic and what is radiographic. It's completely arbitrary. The degree of sacroiliitis 
depends or uh, makes the diagnosis of non-radiographic or radiographic. The point I want to bring up is it's an arbitrary diagnosis and it doesn't really make any difference. The last bullet point is also interesting. These were non-radiographic XLSPA patients and about 15% of them had already had syndesmophytes and we still call them non-radiographic. So even that name is a misnomer. So in the same study, if you look at the spine, which is shown in the cumulative probability plot on the left-hand side, 97% of the patients either on secukinumab or placebo had no radiographic progression over two years at all. On the right-hand side, it shows that the mean change in the sacroiliac leg joint MRI, bone marrow edema score, and as expected, secukinumab suppresses the bone marrow edema. Not surprising, it's an IL-17 inhibitor. Compared to placebo, there is much more bone marrow edema suppression. All right, so monitoring of axial SPA patients. I said that the, there is a difference in the baseline characteristics of the slide that I showed you earlier, based on which the radiographic progression is dependent. So what are the risk factors for radiographic progression, mostly in the spine, but also in the sacroiliac leg joint? Number one is male sex. Number two, smoking. Number three, active inflammation. Patients with high CRP, uh, and patients who have active inflammation on the MRI have progression, radiographic progression compared to those with low CRP or no inflammation on the MRI and pre-existing syndesmophytes and also positive HLA B27 and also blue collar workers. These are some of the risk factors for radiographic progression in the spine and in the sacroiliac joint. The last bullet point is important and this comes from the ACR, SAA, Spartan treatment recommendations that in daily practice, routine monitoring by MRI is not required. CRP should be monitored. One can do MRI of the sacroiliac leg joint to see if the patient is not responding to see whether the drug has taken away the inflammation or not. But routine monitoring is not required. And really, there is no need for routine spinal X-ray and certainly no need for sacroiliac leg joint X-rays to see whether a patient has gone from non-radiographic to radiographic. Because as I said, even in the expert hand, 25% of the time, they make a mistake themselves. If you show them the X-rays two years later, they suddenly say, oh, this person has ankylosing spondylitis when two years before they had said this patient has non-radiographic XLSPA. All right, that brings us to the fourth topic here, radiographic progression in ankylosing spondylitis. The previous one was radiographic progression in non-radiographic. This is the first ever head-to-head -head study of ENF inhibitor versus IL-17 inhibitor. This study is a surpass study. This is not even published in full form yet. I've taken these, um, this from the late breaking abstract from last year's American College of Rheumatology meeting. Secukinumab versus adalimumab biosimilar head-to-head -head study to assess radiographic progression in ankylosing spondylitis. The hypothesis was that secukinumab is better than adalimumab in preventing or in reducing the radiographic progression. These were active patients with ankylosing spondylitis, and these were chosen to have all the risk factors that I told you. Nearly 80% of the people were males. Their mean high sensitivity CRP was 20, quite high. 73% had pre-existing syndesmophytes. So these are the risk factors for progression. These people who enrolled into the study were destined to have more radiographic progression. And the primary endpoint was proportion of patients with no radiographic progression. That means the MSAS change of less than or equal to 0.5. And these patients had X-rays and MRIs at baseline and X-rays and MRI at two years. Three central readers, again, they read the X-rays before, they read the X-rays at two years. They were blinded for treatment and the chronology of the images. And here are the results. The primary endpoint was not met. The idea was that secukinumab will be better. However, there was slight numerical benefit for secukinumab, but really no statistical difference. 66%, nearly 67%, and 65% patients had no progression. So slight higher number in secukinumab, but this is not statistically significant. The both the secukinumab 150 milligram, 300 milligram, adalimumab biosimilar, they had very similar number of patients. If you look at the tab, uh, table on the left-hand side, it shows you the change from baseline in the MSAS. 
for circuit map 150, the change from baseline is 0 0.54, circuit map 300 milligram 0 0.55, and limo map 0.72. Again, slight numerical difference, not statistically different. So it was a negative study. And if you look on the right hand side, the cumulative percentage plots, they lie one on top of the other. What does that tell me? So my takeaway is technically the surpass study is negative. However, the spinal radiographic progression over two years in this population of patients who were destined to actually progress more, high number of males, high number of inflammation, existing damage, these are all risk factors. The spinal radiographic progression was very low, less than one MSES point. And there was no significant difference between secukinumab and adalimumab. So it appears that IL-17 inhibitor is as effective as TNF inhibitor in preventing radiographic progression. I think this is a good news. And the last bullet point is once we start our patients on the biologic, whether it is IL-17 or TNF inhibitor, and ask them to stop smoking, we can't do anything much more than that to prevent radiographic progression because, it, as you can see, whether they are on TNF inhibitor or IL-17 inhibitor, their progression is very low over a two-year period. Lastly, is blocking IL-17A, how are we doing for time? Yes, we have got a few minutes. How is blocking IL-17A plus IL-17F different than blocking IL-17A alone? Is it better? So this is the bimekizumab study in non-radiographic XLSP and ankylosing spondylitis. Two different studies. B-mobile one was non-radiographic. B-mobile two is ankylosing spondylitis. And this is recently published in January of this year. So bimekizumab inhibits IL-17 A and F. Both studies met their primary analysis, primary endpoint, which was at week 16. It was ASS-40 as shown in the top those uh, line graphs and compared to placebo, uh, the drug was effective, not surprising. This is IL-17A and F inhibitor. The bottom colorful graph shows that the SDAS disease state, the red, which is the baseline, then the middle one is week 16 and then week 24. As you can see, as we go from baseline to week 16 to week 24, the green becomes more and the red becomes less. Red is the high disease activity or very high disease activity, green is low disease activity or inactive disease. So by end of uh, 24 weeks, about more than 50% of the patients on bimekizumab have either low disease or inactive disease. So straightforward study, bimekizumab works. The question is, is this better than IL-17A inhibitor alone? And difficult to say because this study did not include for comparison what happens to IL-17A inhibitors. However, there's some curious things about this study. If you look at, if you compare biologic naive and TNF inhibitor inadequate responder patient within these two studies, so both studies, B-Mobile 1 and B-Mobile 2 included small number of patients who were TNF inhibitor inadequate responder. On the left-hand side, what you're seeing is ASAS-40 responses in non-radiographic XLSP, B-Mobile 1 study, TNF naive and TNF inadequate responder. And the same thing I'm showing you on the right-hand side in ankylosing spondylitis. And as you can see, the responses are similar, at least the difference in the bimekizumab and placebo. And now you are definitely going to say, oh, the numbers are small. And you are correct. The numbers are very small in the TNF inhibitor inadequate responder patients, only 17 here and 10 there. One patient here and there can make a difference in the non-radiographic. Look on the right-hand side. Here also the numbers are slightly better, still small, 17 and 37. The difference between the placebo, the delta looks quite good. However, Yes, I agree, numbers are small. What happens in psoriatic arthritis? So this is the make is why I've been psoriatic arthritis, biologic naive and TNF inhibitor, inadequate responder. Here, the numbers are not small. These are two different studies. Be optimal, study on biologic naive, 852 patient. This is ACR 50 response shown on the left for a biologic naive in be optimal. On the right-hand side, be complete. This is TNF inhibitor, inadequate responder patient, 400 patient, again, here. Now, these are two different studies we are comparing, but the delta looks very similar. Here is delta, looks very, very similar. So both studies met primary endpoint and response looks comparable. And lastly, looking at bimkizumab in psoriasis, here the primary endpoint is PASI-90 response, 
by number of prior biologics. So if you look at the line graphs on the top, zero biologic, one prior biologic, two prior biologics, and they're all lying one on top of the other. So again, it appears that there may be, and so I've shown you now, non-radiographic axillary SPA, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and psoriasis. There appears to be that in patients who are TNF inhibitor inadequate responder patients, they still get as good a response, maybe, compared to those who are TNF inhibitor naive. At least there is a signal here. Is there a biologic possibility, and this is my second last slide, are TNF inhibitor inadequate responder patient immunologically any different? So I'm showing you a study which was published. This is an abstract uh, by Siebert, uh, Stephen C. Siebert. This is taken from Gusilkumab. So this is serum samples from Discover 1, Discover 2, Cosmos. These are three studies on Gusilkumab with psoriatic arthritis. Serum samples were collected and they looked at patients who are TNF inhibitor naive and TNF inhibitor inadequate responder. And they looked at the baseline IL-22, IL-17A, IL-17F, IL-6 CRP and SAA levels in that serum. And what you see here, those circles is patients who had TN who were TNF inhibitor inadequate responder, the baseline serum levels for IL-22, IL-17A and IL-17F levels from pooled treatment groups were higher in TNF inhibitor inadequate responder than naive patient. Maybe that's the reason why blocking L17A and L17F in this particular population of patient gives you such a good response. Just your um, polling question, what do you think? You remember this is a, a male patient with a history of uveitis with intermittent inflammatory back pain for several years, um, uh, um, 27 positive. So do you think uh, this is Excel SPA now? And you have the following options. So uh, Excel spondyl arthritis, maybe you, you think this is just an osteoarthritis of sacroiliac joints. Um, maybe it's uh, for you degenerative spinal disease spinal discitis or other diagnosis or the diagnosis is unclear. So please vote now and uh, in, in a few seconds um, uh, I will show you the uh, correct answer. So let's have a precise look at uh, um, MRI images. So first here uh, in a stir sequence, we see that sacroiliac joints, uh, they, they both look quite good. Um, th there is no bone marrow edema in sacroiliac joints, but you see some bone, bone marrow edema in, in the vertebral body here of the fifth uh, lumbar um, vertebral body. So uh, what, what, what is this? You will see it on the a, on a following slide. And here you see that there are no structural changes in sacroiliac joints, at least no SPA typical structural changes, but you have some capsulification here. And this uh, huge osteophyte was responsible for a picture of uh, ankylosis or pseudo ankylosis on the X-ray. Um, but this has nothing to do with ankylosis as a part of excel spondyl arthritis. This is um, a common degenerative finding. And then you have a degenerated disc here um, uh, with uh, some um, fatty metaplasia of the bone marrow, so-called modic two lesion. So old lesion you saw also in stir that there was a little bit of inflammation here uh, around this. And this is the most likely explanation of intermittent uh, symptoms of this patient over the past years and not spinal arthritis. Just to be sure, let's have a look at wipe. We see here again very nicely this huge osteophyte capsule ossification. We see the generated disc and nothing, nothing kind of compatible with spinal arthritis, especially no erosive damage. So in this case, the diagnosis would be degenerated disc disease, no spinal arthritis. And if you answered osteoarthritis of sacroiliac joints, this will, will would also be correct because we have also osteoarthritis findings in the right sacroiliac joint. So let's have a look at a second uh, case. Uh, this is a 
male patient, 55 years old, with the same patient profile. And I saw those both patients uh, uh, within um, uh, uh, two weeks in, in the outpatient uh, setting. And he, he has also been referred to us by an ophthalmologist because of the presence of back pain on the background of uveitis. B27 was also positive, CRP uh, was normal. So let's have a look at um, uh, MRI. In this case, again, you have a stir a picture on the left side and a T1 weighted um, MRI on the right hand side. And um, you might expect that uh, I will be asking the same question again. Do you think that um, in this case, the diagnosis could be exospondylarthritis or something else? So have a closer look at the images and then please try to answer the question. Uh, which diagnosis would you make in this case? Excel SPA, osteoarthritis, infectious sacroiliitis, osteitis condensans, ELE, or other diagnosis, or the situation is rather unclear. So again, a few seconds to um, um, uh, answer this question, and then there will be a, um, an uh, answer to it. So in this case, uh, we see on STIR uh, image a little bit of bone marrow edema. We, we are here in a rather posterior part of the joint. So we see um, and here a little bit of bone marrow edema, a little bit here and so close to the capsule. I need to say that all these uh, areas uh, affected by bone marrow edema right now might be also manifestation of mechanical stress in the diesel part of the joint and the capsule. So this is not very convincing. And it is a big question now, uh, is it bone marrow edema related to spondylarthritis or not? And as we discussed previously, um, in, in such a situation, it is extremely important to, to look at uh, a T1 weighted sequence to see are there uh, structural changes. And if we look at uh, T1, we see that they are there. Uh, so we have fatty metaplasia, we have uh, erosions. You see that the uh, uh, joint uh, margin is uh, uh, clearly abnormal. You have also backfills, so repaired erosions, and you have also a bone barred, so a step just before the ankylosis. So finally, in this case, the interpretation of this tiny bone marrow edema would be absolutely clear. This is a manifestation of excel spondylarthritis, and the diagnosis could be made in this case. The problem is, however, that uh, things are not always what they seem. And uh, in the daily clinical practice, it is extremely important to identify what is true bone marrow edema associated with spondylarthritis and what is bone marrow edema related to mechanical stress. There's been um, several um, publications, several uh, attempts to uh, look at uh, you know, the prevalence of uh, mechanically induced uh, bone marrow edema, and this is uh, uh, work uh, which uh, evaluated recreational runners and uh, lit ice hockey players, and here we had uh, really a big prevalence of bone marrow edema from 30 to 40 percent in apparently healthy uh, people without uh, any uh, back pain complaints. And uh, this study was also important to demonstrate the anatomical areas which are affected by mechanical stress in uh, these athletes. And we learned from this study that uh, caudal part of the joint and very anterior part of the joint they are affected by mechanical stress. So if you see um, bone marrow edema or sclerosis in this or this area, um, there should be a suspicion that these changes might be related to mechanical stress and not to uh, um, inflammatory disease. There were several other works which demonstrated that uh, indeed bone marrow edema is quite prevalent in healthy subjects and people with chronic 
back pain in runners and in postpartal women. One of the most recent uh, works uh, uh, was dealing with healthy young uh, people from a population-based cohort and this study has identified that bone marrow edema uh, was present in um, uh, about 17 percent of uh, um, uh, um, healthy people um, uh, with uh, uh, MRI of sacroiliac charts. So that means that the specificity of um, uh, bone marrow edema, um, at least based on the results of this cohort, would be about 83%. And we need to learn how to identify uh, bone marrow edema that's, that is really related to inflammation. So the most important things are uh, the um, localization of bone marrow edema. So if it is localized in the area affected by mechanical stress, such as very anterior portion of the joint, it is non, uh, not specific. And also, if you don't see any signs of structural damage, especially in patients presenting to you after two, three, four years um, after symptom onset, back pain onset, would be highly suspicious that the, 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 there is no uh, inflammatory um, disease behind this. What could help us in imaging interpretation? We are working on uh, implementation of artificial intelligence method like um, um, uh, deep learning to detect active inflammatory and structural changes associated with spondyloarthritis. And the first uh, study um, was uh, uh, quite successful. It showed that uh, the machine, the computer, is able to detect active inflammatory and structural changes uh, compatible with spondyloarthritis very close uh, to the uh, level to the judgments done by by the experts. So uh, this is work in progress, and uh, I do believe that uh, human intelligence is even more important than artificial intelligence, and that is why we are doing um, uh, many uh, educational efforts uh, to uh, improve uh, that differentiation between uh, inflammatory and all other. Um, the problems uh, um, in the spine. And well, what you see here is Aza's online case library. That this is an educational ongoing project where you can see um, um, quite a number of examples of patients uh, presenting with suspicion of uh, spondyloarthritis with and without the final diagnosis of Excel SPA, where there is quite detailed explanation of clinical picture lab findings and also imaging findings. I um, um, come to my take-home messages and uh, the diagnostic workup in patients with suspicion of excess spondylarthritis normally includes proper use and interpretation of imaging. MRI of sacroiliac joints is a method of objective detection of active inflammatory, post-inflammatory uh, changes and uh, is very important, therefore, um, in the early diagnosis and differential diagnosis of Excel SPA. It's very important to stress that uh, bone marrow edema in sacroiliac joints might be related to mechanical issues, and um, the presence of bone marrow edema should always be uh, interpreted in the context of anatomical localization and presence of structural changes and of course in the clinical context and finally if we're talking about technical aspects so t2 weighted fat saturated sequence such as tur or term and t white weighted sequence are normally sufficient no gadolinium is needed and the wipe sequence or another 3d created sequence is included now as an additional third very helpful um, uh, mri sequence to make the right uh, uh, diagnosis in our patients. That's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. This was the landmark study in this regards. This is Seth, Seth Vanderlin's study from 1984, where he did he did a population study of 2,957 people from, from Holland. And what he found was that among individuals 45 years of age or older, 21% 
a B27 positive relatives of a, a B27 positive AS patients have AS, as opposed to only 1.3% of HLA B27 positive individuals in the population at large. So there's something about familiarity that seems to be going on here that uh, as far as the impact of B27 on developing disease. We thought, well, maybe what's happening is that in these families, there's a higher genetic load, that there these other genes, the ERAP1, the, the uh, uh, IL-23 receptor and the like, were at play. So Rudy Joshi, who's actually in practice in Beaumont, uh, uh, looked at this with our cohort, uh, uh, looking at, at 312 uh, multi, uh, uh, probands from multiplex AS families and 190 uh, uh, families where there was no uh, affected first-degree relatives. And we could not, uh, we did find that HLA B27 was significantly more prevalent in familial versus sporadic AS, cases of AS, about 95%. If you're uh, uh, people who were familiar AS, would be B27 positive, suppose around 85, 90% uh, of those where it's not familial. But beyond that, we really didn't see too much more with 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 uh, other genes that, that this idea of heavier genetic load is at play here. Uh, this is looking at, at a, a, a Swedish nested case control study. This is from a national patient registry. So the diagnoses were, the, the, you know, and you, one thing that's great in Europe that you can, they have these registries that, uh, that, that we could not do in the U.S. God knows you'd never get them. They had the government having everyone's medical records to do a, have a registry. That just doesn't happen in the United States. Uh, and the bottom line is this, this looking at, at, at a national registry. And they matched up an index patient with with uh, 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 with age and sex matched up to fifty uh, general general population controls, and they found that that indeed that the overall risk for familial AS that the likelihood of AS to be occurring in the family was nineteen point four. So very significant impact uh, if you have AS of a family member of yours also being more likely uh, to to develop AS. I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking more about that cohort later. So let's talk about one of the cardinal features of AS, which is chronic inflammatory back pain. Uh, there are criteria that are out there, starting with Andre Kahle in 1977, up to the more most recent ASAS criteria in 2009. We actually looked at this, and they're all about the same. It's young, young onset, morning stiffness, improvement with back pain with exercise, but not with rest, uh, awakening late at night, alternating body pain, all alike. Uh, all of these, by the way, uh, more recent study actually showed that the Berlin criteria performed better than any of the other ones. And that's actually what we use in NHANES. And when in NHANES, what we found wa was uh, looking at chronic, about 19.4% of the US population between the ages of 15 and 70, we found in NHANES to have chronic back pain, back pain present every day for at least three months. 19.4%. That's a massive unmet need. But what was interesting is that we looked at the, whether, depending on, regardless of the criteria, Kalen, he says, gee, or the, either of the two Berlin uh, modifications, we see that the prevalence uh, of inflammatory back pain runs between five and 6%. That's, that is uh, uh, nearly, uh, more than, nearly a third of those with chronic back pain have chronic inflammatory back pain. It's also noteworthy that women were slightly more affected in men, and of course, whites were more commonly affected than the other patient groups. And so we followed it up with a study that was published last year, where we then did, a, we looked at everything that's ever been published about back pain. This is over 5,000 uh, articles that uh, Dr. Rian and I spent a huge amount of time on this. Uh, and I did the work myself, so I, I, I will. Uh, and we found, bottom line, there's never been a paper published looking at chronic inflammatory back pain starting later in life. But when we looked at the NHANES data, that 2.9% of the people in the U.S. population uh, 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 ha uh, had chronic inflammatory back pain beginning after the age of 50. So this is a real entity that there's no one's ever really studied. Now, there's a reason for that, because it, after in the later years, it, it gets to be the concept of IVP gets less specific. It could be late onset axial spa, or it could be PMR, fibromyalgia, Paget's disease, or osteoarthritis. So that's probably why uh, even the criteria try to rule these people out. And so it's just not studied. So uh, Asim Khan uh, looked at, well, this is another sort of landmark paper from 1985, looked, and he found that that characters of spinal leaf symptoms of having back pain, uh, uh, they were talking chronic 
inflammatory back pain back then, was more likely in B27 positive versus B27 negative family members. Uh, that Tarina followed that up and, and found that not only did first degree relatives fulfilling the osseous axial spa or ESG classification criteria have more inflammatory back pain, but they also had a higher level of disease activity and more psoriasis. Uh, Dijong uh, followed us up and, and found that features associated with spa or imaging abnormalities found 33% of seemingly healthy first degree relatives. And now here, in contrast to Dr. Khan's original study, he found also in B27 negative first degree relatives. Uh, Karim Dugan from our group, we've actually published this back in, in 2020 in RMD Open, uh, looked, uh, looked at uh, 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 155 first degree relatives with chronic inflammatory back pain, 82 with mechanical back pain, and 162 with no back pain at all. And we, we, we saw that they are pretty much, uh, uh, in fact, we found in the no back pain, they, were, they tended to be somewhat older. But what we found that those with inflammatory back pain had much younger age at onset, as you, as you can see, age 26 versus 40 with mechanical back pain. And, and also uh, a, a higher likelihood of having heel pain. Those who had inflammatory back pain versus mechanical back pain, uh, and and then what he did was he compared the those uh, first degree relatives, the, the probands only, so one per family, with the, the with the Enhane study, and what they found wa was that the that the, the first degree relatives of AS patients were likely to have uveitis. Uh, 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 looking at those with Enhane's who had chronic back pain, were more likely to have have uh, a younger age at onset. Uh, and a, again, as I said, uh, looking at an, another group, much higher frequency of chronic heel pain, and interesting enough. And but more importantly, as far, especially as far as the, the uh, FDA is concerned, is that we followed these people up with the chronic inflammatory back pain compared to the chronic mechanical back pain. And lo and behold, that those with the chronic inflammatory back pain looked at an average of 16 months later, still had chronic inflammatory back pain, whereas the, most of the people with mechanical back pain had gone away. So this is a stable phenotype that lasts in first degree relatives over time. Uh, uh, Vanderlin now, uh, and this is a recent study that was just published, uh, uh, back in 1985, this is a different cohort than the one he did before. Look at 363 AS probands from Switzerland this time, the Swiss cohort study. And, and then he, he followed them over 30 years with very I mean, a remarkable study. And what, what he found, it was pretty much the, found, the same thing he found in the Netherlands, uh, that the, the lifetime recurrence rate uh, in B27 positive first degree relatives of AS patients was, was significantly high. However, what he found was that this is, this is sort of strange, that the risk for offspring in B27 positive uh, mothers is higher than the, than fathers. That, in other words, you're more likely to get disease from mom than from dad. Uh, uh, so that and, and that led to their hypothesis that female AS probands are genetically enriched with disease set belly genes. As I showed you before, Joshi could not see that. And in fact, if you combine that, that uh, two, these are two patient uh, advocacy uh, patient uh, societies. So these are people who are volunteering, uh, and we don't have confirmed diagnosis radiographically. But they found that again, that that uh, uh, that we look at the mothers versus the fathers, and we found a higher prevalence in both the Swiss, the Swiss cohort. Uh, uh, as well as, as a slightly higher in, in in a UK study of Matt Brown's that was just published uh, uh, of, of the mother passing on disease than the father. Uh, they didn't really see that in the Swedish study. Again, this is a national registry. Those are patient uh, advocacy groups. We have I've looked at this and we we could not confirm that. We actually found this time what we did is we examined the patients and the first year relatives and we x-rayed them. Uh, and and we we looked at at uh, 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 92 parent offspring pairs, and we actually found more transmission from the fathers. So I don't think I, I don't think that we've established which parent is more likely to transmit the disease. But the question is: so you 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 have a patient with AS, and they want to bring their their, their son or daughter in because they're worried because they have symptoms. So how can we work on this better? Well, this is the this paper that was actually it was presented at ACR. Uh, 
uh, well, that uh, looking at the so-called polygenic risk scores, it's been looked at in rheumatoid arthritis, the likes the hot topic right now. It's being looked at actually uh, at the highest levels with the NIH right now. And whether or not genetic profiling might be informative to develop disease uh, 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 symptoms prior to it actually developing. Uh, and they found that the definitive loci, like the classic IL-23R, et cetera, had limited discriminatory capability. So uh, Matt Brown and we were in, in conjunction with us uh, set out to develop and validate the optimal polygenic risk score to assist in the early diagnosis and identify subsequent high risk for AS. So what he did was he we started with a training set with uh, 8,000 Europeans. We contributed 1,040 to the group and 14,000 controls, as well as 6,000 people from China. China, as I as our former president would say. And he used as a validation set uh, 910 Turk patients and 430 Iranian patients. Uh, we had to try to get the North Koreans involved too, but they wouldn't play ball, uh, just to sort of cross all lines. Uh, and it was interesting what they found. So if they looked at just B27 alone using uh, uh, re receiver operating, uh, operator characteristic analysis scores, that, that B27 didn't do a bad job, wasn't great. We compared B27 alone by then taking all the SNPs that we found in, in, the, in the GWAS. And, and what we found is when we combined both the MA, they, if we took out the MHC, it wasn't that impressive, the, the RLC scores. But if we threw in the MHC using this polygenic risk score uh, paradigm that was developed, that it performed very, very well in, in Europeans, uh, not so well in, in Chinese and intermediately well in the, in the Iranians and Turks. So that what they did, they had to reformulate that because I didn't show you the data, but some of the other genes we found in the GWAS didn't carry over into Asia necessarily. So they devised an East Asian polygenic risk score, slightly different. Here, of course, the Asians looked really, really good. The, what, the Europeans, not quite so good. And again, we see an intermediate response between uh, uh, in, in the Iranians and Turks, probably reflecting the genetic admixture uh, in those regions between East and West Asia. But what's interesting, then we, we compare that with MRI, it actually was comparable to MRI and much better than CRP. So, so the question is, what are we going to do with this? Uh, one, this is actually besides the conclusion of the last slide. So what are we going to do with this information? Well, we found that the polygenic risk score actually performed slightly better. Men were slightly more likely to be B27 positive than, than were women in both Europeans and Asians, slightly just, you know, 83 versus 78%, 93 versus 85%. So women were slightly less likely to be between some positive with AS, but this is ankylosing spawn one, it's just not including axial spawn non-radiographic. Uh, uh, and, and that there was a non-significant trend that the, the, that the, that the, the PRS performed slightly better in men than in women, but it still performed fairly well. So that begs a question that I'll deal with in the last slide. And and it's, and this is my take home message. Although predisposition to AXPA has both genetic and non genetic contributions to pathogenesis, genetic factors are without any question predominant influence. Over ninety percent of the overall disease causation is coming from genetic factors. Okay, AXPA clearly clusters in families, particularly in HLA B twenty seven positive first degree relatives, but where more than one in five B twenty seven positive will develop disease over time. Although, and this is important to note, that you will see other features of disease like psoriasis and the like, even in the B27 negatives. And the Lord knows I've certainly seen, seen it. Uh, the IBP is much more common in first key relatives of, of, of axial soft patients compared to either the, compared to the U.S. population. And in those B27 positives, persists over time. So it's a stable phenotype. Uh, whether the father or mother is more likely to influence disease transmission is not the ability to determined. And despite all those exciting data with the polygenic risk scores, this is the bottom line here. Recent innovations in genetic testing may help in the diagnosis in symptomatic FDRs, we call it. Uh, but as a screening tool in asymptomatic relatives, without any question, God knows I've, li I've lived this, can cause far more harm than good. So this, this test may be useful
Coach, hope you can hear me. I'm calling you from uh, the road. I want to thank the sponsor of this podcast and this Tuesday Night Rheumatology. Lily is the supporter of the spondoarthritis section of our Room Now Live conference. I hope you enjoyed from the meeting. I'm looking at the Q&As. I don't see any open uh, questions. Um, Hi, it's Jack Cush. I hope you can hear me. I hope you enjoyed that session. Tuesday night remote. Yeah, I can. I can certainly hear you, Jack. <clears throat> yeah, this is a tool. I can. I can hear you. I think there was a okay. period. There was a small period where uh, you went off, or maybe there was a problem in my computer. But actually, I'm on a stable clinic, my university computer. So there was something in between. But if you can hear me, I, I can certainly hear you now. Doctor Diadar, we can hear you. Okay. And so. Okay. Go ahead, Jack. So are there any questions from the audience, Brandy? The, there was one question about CRP and sedimentation rate and how important are they in diagnosing spondyloarthritis. And I wrote back to them saying that uh, CRP and sedimentation rate, of course, they, they are inflammatory markers and they, are, they can be nonspecific. And secondly, 60% of the time in spondyloarthritis patient, they can be normal. And that reduces their uh, help uh, or usefulness, I should say, in making the diagnosis. Of course, in a patient that you're seeing, if they have got uh, no other cause for their, no obvious cause for any set rate CRP to be high, then they can be helpful to a certain extent. But there is a limit to how much they can be of help in making the diagnosis of XLSPA. Yeah, a corollary question. I can't hear Jack now. Oh, can you hear me now? Um, hold on. I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't hear you. you I, I could hear corollary question, but beyond that, I did not hear what your question was. So there was a question about a patient with long-standing ankylosing spondylitis infusion for more than 20 years, but has a normal set rate in CRP. Do you use a biologic? Oh, I see. What is the percentage of having... Uh... Sorry. So if someone, has a normal, if someone has a normal set rate in CRP, but they have active disease, infused disease, does that preclude them from getting a biologic? Well, so <clears throat> according to the American College of Rheumatology, the biologic decision whether to give them biologic or not depends on the patient's symptoms. If you are definite that the person has axial SPA, number one, they have tried non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in the full dose, and if they have got symptoms, then I would treat them with biologic in practice anyway, irrespective whether they have high sedimentation rate or C-reactive protein. High CRP is a predictor of good response to TNF inhibitors. That is true. However, in my clinical practice, I will not decline somebody a biologic just because they have got normal CRP and normal sedimentation rate, knowing that 60% of the time, said rate CRP can be normal. Um, <clears throat> I think Dr. Kush's connection dropped a tool. So there's a couple of <laughs> questions in the queue. Okay, sure, and sure. I so I will answer those questions. There is one question. What is the what is the percentage of active spondyloarthritis, axial or peripheral, having normal CRP? And I would say uh, 60%. 60% of the patient can have significant symptoms, but they will, and so we think they have got active disease. They might actually show evidence on the MRI as well. They may have swollen joints, peripheral joints, but their CRP can't be normal. This is an obstacle in getting the approval of biologics in some parts of the world. 
Yeah, that is, uh, that's unfortunate because we are not really treating the C-reactive protein. Depending on the C-reactive protein, we should be treating depending on the patient's symptoms. And the disease activity as defined in the American College of Rheumatology in the ACR Spartan treatment guidelines states that uh, if the patient has got significant symptoms which are in the mind of the patient and the doctor are because of their axial SPA and they are severe enough, then that is active disease. Forget about the separate CRP. And that's how we would practice at least here in the US. There's a question about how important is imaging inflammation, but symptoms are minimal. Do you have to treat? <clears throat> and so the answer is no, um, because the bone marrow edema can be found in normal people. Degenerative disc disease, degenerative changes in the sacroiliac joint as well. And patients become disabled because of their symptoms. The symptoms is the most paramount reason why I would be treating them. Um, American College of ACR treatment guidelines suggest that if you're treating the patient with biologics and they still continue to get symptoms, and then you are unsure whether their symptoms are because is the disease still active, is my drug not working? That would be a situation I would do an MRI. So somebody is on biologic, you're treating them fully with a biologic, they have got symptoms are still going on, then you should do an MRI scan. And if now they have got active inflammation, then I would change the biologic because now their symptoms and the bone marrow edema tells me that the drug that I'm using is not working. But otherwise, I would, in the situation that you suggest, if the symptoms are normal, symptoms are minimal, I wouldn't even worry about doing a bone marrow or doing an MRI scan. And that bone marrow edema, if they've got no symptoms to me, is of very low consequence. I wouldn't do anything. Do you believe in clinical or imaging if patients have inflammatory back pain but negative MRI? Um, if somebody has got completely stone cold normal, negative MRI is, I, I would then go and, if the patient has inflammatory back pain and I'm convinced this patient has, then I would go back to the radiologist and I will discuss and I'll ask them, is it completely stone cold normal? Is there no bone marrow edema? Fair enough, but are there any changes, structural changes? Is there changes of, are there changes suggestive of old inflammation? Is there fatty um, infiltrates that suggest that there was inflammation in the past? Are there erosions? Uh, are there these backfill changes, et cetera, et cetera? If there is completely, completely normal MRI scan, nothing on the on inflammation, nothing on, so nothing on STIR image, nothing on T1 weighted image, then I would be very careful of calling this person axial SPA. I would need something, some kind of objective finding. Objective finding of uveitis, objective finding of peripheral arthritis, inflammatory arthritis, psoriasis, history of real inflammatory bubble disease. Enthesitis is kind of also a little bit dodgy in that situation. And I would be very careful of totally stone cold, normal MRI, normal CRP, normal cell rate, B27 negative and nothing. I would be very worried that this may not be axial SPA. Inflammatory back pain alone does not make the diagnosis of axial spondyloarthritis. Patients with mechanical back pain can also have what sounds inflammatory back pain. Inflammatory back pain is a misnomer. It's in what you ask, what the patient understands, what they tell you, and what you understand, what they're telling you, etc. So basing the diagnosis purely on inflammatory back pain is, in my mind, not appropriate. All right, what would be the best biological to treat patients enthesitis or inflammatory tenosynovitis? So there is only one study that I'm aware of where they looked at IL-1223 inhibitor, eustachinumab versus TNF inhibitor. That was an open label study. And that showed that eustachinumab was better in that study, small study, open label. Eustachinumab was better than TNF inhibitor. Overall, I personally think that TNF inhibitors are very good in controlling enthesitis or tenosynovitis. 
uh, IL-23 inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors are also both very good in controlling the enthesitis in the peripheral joints. Enthesitis in the axial skeleton, there is something different. And that's the reason why IL-23 inhibitors do not work on axial disease, at least in axial spondyloarthritis, they failed. Whether IL-23 inhibitors really work in axial PSA is still an open question. There is a study uh, being conducted on guselcumab in axial PSA uh, because in the uh, guselcumab studies in psoriatic arthritis, in the subset of patients who had uh, imaging proven sacroiliac joint involvement, uh, guselcumab seemed to improve BASDAI. Guselcumab seemed to improve ASDAS in those patients. So a prospective study is being done with MRI as one of the outcome measures to see whether uh, guselcumab not only will improve the symptoms, but will also improve MRI uh, evidence of inflammation in the sacroiliac joint in axial PSA. But your question is about enthesitis. So to me, TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitor, IL-1223 inhibitor, and IL-23, pure P19, IL-23 inhibitor, they, all of them should work on inflammatory tenosynovitis or enthesitis. And I don't think one is better than the other. Last question is radiographic. No, there are more. No, radiographic progression in the prevent and surpass studies was correlated with inadequate control of symptoms. So um, the surpass study, uh, so, um, okay, in the surpass study, the results are not yet out about the, how did um, secukinumab versus adalimumab biosimilar, that was surpass study in ankylosing spondylitis patient. We don't have results of the symptoms, clinical symptoms that is not yet published. Uh, and so I cannot answer that part. Prevent study was successful. Prevent study was secukinumab versus placebo in non-radiographic XLSPA. That was a successful study, 52-week placebo-controlled secukinumab study in non-radiographic XLSPA. Secukinumab was definitely better than placebo in controlling the symptoms. ASAS-40 is all the symptoms and ASAS-40 was the primary endpoint. And at week 16 and week 52, and based on that, secukinumab got approval by the FDA to treat non-radiographic XLSPA. Interestingly, two years later, when the X-rays were looked at, there was no difference between the placebo and secukinumab, mainly because the placebo patients also did not really progress. This is the PREVENT study I'm talking about. SURPASS study also, this is ankylosing spondylitis, and there we are looking at... Um, patients and they were looking at MSAS scores in the spine and surpass study was done on patients who are male and high HLA-B27 and high CRP and existing syndesmophyte and etc. So that was an enriched population to progress with new bone formation and to our surprise they did not progress. The total increase in MSAS was just 0.54 and 0.76 in the adalimumab biosimilar 0 0.54 in the secukinumab. So it's a surprise that despite choosing a group of patients who should be progressing, they did not progress and there was no difference. Numerically, secukinumab was better, but there was no real difference between the two. And um, uh, that showed that IL-17 inhibitor was as good as prevention uh, of uh, structural progression compared to TNF inhibitor. Your question is about control of symptoms, we do not know yet how that uh, shown because those results are not yet out. All right, I see no other open questions. Thank you, Dr. Didar, for joining us tonight and for answering the Q&A. And I just wanna remind everyone to join us next Tuesday, same time, same place um, where we'll be talking about RA decisive therapeutics. So see you then. Again, thank you. Everyone have a great evening and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Bye-bye.